This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. This morning I want to try as much as possible to direct our thinking toward the heart of what our Christian faith is all about, namely that of the relationship between an individual and the person of Jesus Christ. It's my hope and my prayer that in the life of some person today, God might be allowed to work yet another miracle as he moves in a wonderful way in the heart of one who has not yet experienced this tremendous relationship with the living Christ. That person may even be you. This morning I want us to think together on the subject of regeneration. It's another one of those big words that we preachers often throw around, seldom taking the time to explain what we mean by it, and often, I fear, not really understanding ourselves what we mean by the word. Today, I want to try and make this word and its meaning so clear that even the youngest child who is present here will understand what it means. The biblical basis for what I say will be primarily the third chapter of John. It is in this chapter that we find that marvelous expression of God's love for us in verse 16. John 3, 16. Martin Luther once said that this was the gospel in a nutshell. Another person said, if you take away from him all the Old Testament and all the New Testament and leave him with only one text, for God so loved the world, he would know enough of the heart of God and of the plan of salvation to be saved. Regeneration. What does it mean? Well, we might begin by saying it means to reform or to recreate. It means to generate anew. That's right. But that statement leaves me rather cold. This is a dictionary definition of the word. Actually, regeneration means something to us only when we experience it or even when we see it in the life of someone whom we know. <clears throat> if you've ever seen a person who has tried to live life according to some plan other than God's plan, and then you've seen that person come to the absolute end of the way, seeing the futility of such trying, and then you see that person accept new life in Christ, then you have seen real regeneration. Maybe that person was you. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And what's the difference between our first birth and our second birth? In what ways is the birth that all of us have had from the birth that some of us have experienced. Well, in the first birth, the human birth, we are partakers of human nature. In the second birth, we are partakers of divine nature. In that first birth, we come into the natural world. In our second birth, we come into the spiritual world. In the first birth, we receive the image of our natural parents. In the second birth, we receive the image, that's not the physical image now, of our Heavenly Father. Jesus said that unless there is a rebirth experience, a real regeneration, a person cannot see the kingdom of God. Some people feel that they cannot come to Jesus because of a misunderstanding of certain kind of doctrine in the Bible. One man once said that if he could explain the atonement how it actually worked that a man dying on the cross over 2,000 years ago could be something for me now? If he could understand that, then he had become a Christian. But the person who says this will never come to Jesus. For we cannot begin to understand God's truth until we first come in submission to the Lord. That position would be about as foolish as a college student who might say, I will never study astronomy until I can fully understand it all. 
or I will never enter a class in mathematics until I can solve every problem. No, the person who holds back and will not surrender his life to Christ until all the questions are answered will be like the person who says, I would like to become a great swimmer someday, but I'm not going to commit myself to the water until I first learn how to swim. Then I'll get in the water. This experience of the new birth or of regeneration does not occur when a person stands back with fists raised at God saying, Okay, God, I'll trust myself to you only as far as I can see and understand. Man once came to the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody many years ago and he said to him, Preacher, if you will answer this list of questions I have about God and the Bible, I'll become a Christian. But the wise Dr. Moody said, No, no. If you'll become a Christian tonight, if you will truly and honestly accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight, then you come back to me tomorrow morning and I'll answer every question on your list. The man went home and thought very seriously about what he had been told. It made sense to him and so in the privacy of his room, the man got down on his knees and as sincerely as he knew how, he invited Jesus into his heart and life. The next morning he went back to Dwight L. Moody's house. His face was beaming. His heart was rejoicing. And he said, Mr. Moody, I'm not going to have to put you to the trouble of answering all these questions. They've either all been answered or I have found that those that were not answered were, were not really important to begin with. The way is now clear for me. The experience of regeneration or rebirth has been confused with many things today. There are some who think that they've really been reborn when actually they have not. Let me tell you some things that regeneration is not. It is not renouncing the error in a person's life. Even a terrorist might come to the place where he sees he's made an error. But this is a far cry from an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Regeneration is not the same as external reformation. I've seen many people turn over a new leaf and try to do better. That's simply reformation. For example, I have seen alcoholics go for years without taking a drink. They just quit out of sheer willpower but there was no spiritual experience in their lives, really no regeneration. They may not drink anymore, they're dry, but their life is filled with all sorts of negative anxieties, judgmental attitudes and the like. That is not real sobriety. The only person, only permanent answer to this disease lies in the surrender of an individual to a higher source of power, and we know that is God. Nothing worse than a dry drunk is the phrase that's used often in AA. External reformation is not the same as regeneration. Another thing, regeneration is not the same as good conduct, living a clean, decent life. The classic example of a decent person was Pharisee Nicodemus. But Jesus still told him, you need to be born all over. You need to be born again. Regeneration is not the same thing as going through the forms of religion. Again, Nicodemus was a synagogue official, but he was a walking spiritual skeleton. He was as straight as a gun barrel theologically, but he was an, as empty as a gun barrel spiritually. Giving yourself to Christ as a work of the Spirit of God working in you. You may be content to glide along happily enjoying the pleasures of good living, but this is not enough to satisfy the deepest needs of the soul, not ultimately. If you have not really submitted your will to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there will come a day, just as sure as you're born, when you're going to find this kind of existence to be inadequate. Regeneration or rebirth is not 
just imitation of Jesus either. So often those who try to imitate Christ end up with a long list of negatives. I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do the other. But when Christ gives a person a new birth, it's a positive experience, not what you don't do. Some people need to quit straining at their faith, trying to force out a few good living qualities. Quit trying. Start trusting. The Christian life is a life of faith in someone else, not in yourself. Relax. Let Jesus have your life. See what he can do with it as he lives in you. The good news of the gospel is that Christ died for us. Then he rose from the dead. He is alive today and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he enters the life of every person who will put his trust in Jesus for salvation. You see, he lives in you. Living a life like Jesus lived is not hard. It is impossible. But when we do what we know God wants us to do, then somehow God comes and lives in us. 1 John 3 verse 24 says this, The man who does obey God's command lives in God and God lives in him. And the guarantee of his presence within us is the spirit he has given us. Some of you who know me rather well know that I used to, when I was much younger, I used to enjoy the game of tennis very much. As I've gotten older, I'm not able to play tennis now. But uh, I used to get out there still, even though I was never a professional by any means, I loved to hit the ball. And uh, since I'm standing in the pulpit now, I guess I better go ahead and admit that I was never a really good tennis player. But I always did enjoy the game. Uh, one reason is because somebody said tennis is like checkers. You got to move. Tennis is an active sport. Well, if, if you can imagine, uh, some of you who are uh, followers of tennis, you know, just think about the, the latest tennis player who was so famous. I, I remember many years ago, it was Roger Federer. And uh, he's a Swiss tennis player. Of course, we've had others that have come along since him. Uh, but let's just uh, imagine that, uh, suppose I had the power of a great tennis player, his coordination, his speed. Hey, I got an idea. Let's suppose for just a minute that a great tennis player, whoever you want to name, could get inside of me, Kirk Lawton, preacher, and suppose he could play tennis through me. Oh, I can just imagine how it might be the next time I go out to play tennis. I think at first I'd just sort of fool around and hit the ball the same sorry way I've always done. My opponent would think, oh, that's just the same old preacher over there doing like he's always done. I don't know why he tries to play tennis. But you see, he would not know right then that this tennis pro was living inside me. And so I think that on my first serve, I'd let a, a real strong serve loose. As I placed the ball in the air, I'd come down with a powerful, accurate serve that my opponent can hardly even see, much less return. <laughs> I can just see him now flabbergasted, eyes wide open in bewilderment. I can hear him muttering to himself, wow, Kirk Lawton was surely lucky that time. I've never seen the preacher serve a ball that well. But on other serves, as I continued to let this great tennis player play inside me, my opponent might say, hey, wait, I, I know that's Kirk Lawton over there on the other side of the net, but he sure does play like uh, a professional tennis player I've seen play on TV. And then for a finale, I would turn loose those powerful smashing shots, accurate placements of the ball, blasting backhands, all this tennis ability see, would be flowing out from me because I had that tennis pro living inside me, playing tennis through me. Oh boy, what a day that would be. Now, I can almost hear what some of you are thinking right now. Oh, that's cute, preacher, but that's just a silly little story. And I agree with you. I know it is. Because we're talking about two human beings. That really wouldn't be possible at all. 
But when I talk about Jesus Christ living in you and me, I'm not talking about something which is silly or impossible. This is exactly what God offers to do for you and for me. He wants to live out his life through us. The Apostle Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's Colossians 1.27. In another place, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And how does that work? Well, I'm prone to worry, but Jesus becomes my peace within. I am a sinner, guilty. Jesus becomes my righteousness. I am weak. Jesus becomes my strength. I'm sometimes impatient. Jesus becomes my patience. And so when Christ really lives inside a person, that one is a new person. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. This is new birth or what we call regeneration. Now, the conclusion to this whole matter is simply this. Are we going to let this happen to us? Shall we let this experience take place as we allow Jesus to live in us? Are you afraid of what you'll have to give up, what it'll cost you if you let Jesus take over your life? Our son Jim is 57 years old now. But think back with me to the time when he was about two or three years old. Just imagine <clears throat> me coming home from a trip, maybe a revival somewhere else I was preaching at, and uh, that trip had kept me away for, oh, say two weeks. And suppose I arrive at home and my little boy meets me at the door, flings his arms around me, and he says, Daddy, I've missed you so much. I love you, and I've decided I'm going to obey you just as best as I can from now on. <clears throat> what do you think I would say to that little boy, my son? If I were to respond as an earthly father, the way some people think our heavenly father responds to that kind of situation or attitude, I would take my little son by the shoulders. I'd shake him. I would say with as much hostility and bitterness as I possess, all right, Jim, I've just been waiting for this. I'm going to make you regret this decision for as long as you live. Now I'm going to take all the fun out of your life. First, I'm going to give away all your toys. Everything that you like has got to go. And beginning today, you're going to have to start eating spinach three times a day and rhubarb. I hate rhubarb. <laughs> Do you really think that's the way God would respond if you said, Lord, I love you, and now I want to surrender the control of my life to you. I want to turn my will and my life over to your care. I want to let Jesus come into my heart. I want to be recreated. When you give your life to Christ, you need not worry about what's going to happen to you. Maybe you're afraid he's going to take away your pleasures, cause you to lose your business or your profession, take away your wealth, send you off to some remote country as a missionary. Well, God may or may not ask you to do one or more of these things, but whatever God wants you to do, there's one thing you can count on. You can trust Him. If God leads you to give up anything, He'll give you more of His blessings in return than you could ever receive while you're outside His will. Yes, you need not fear what God will do to you. He reminds us in 1 John 4, 18, we have no need, no fear of somebody who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. If we are afraid, it is for fear of what he might do to us and shows us that we are not fully convinced that he really loves us. Don't you think it's about time to respond to that great love that God has for you? God is saying, don't wait. Why, don't, don't put off any longer that decision you've known for so long that you really need to make. Jesus can make any life new, no matter what you've been, no matter what you've done. This is the miracle of regeneration. 
And if it happened, it has not really happened in your life yet, then why not right now? Oh God, help us to know that you love us far beyond our ability to understand your love. And we pray, Lord, that the little chorus that some of us used to sing years ago might be our prayer. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. We pray this in his wonderful name. Amen.